Good morning. Welcome. My name is Audrey Shillington, and I'm the director for the School of Social Work here at Colorado State University. I also serve as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs for the College of Health and Human Sciences here at CSU. I am just beyond thrilled that we have this opportunity today to be together, to think, to learn, to share. Um, I just, this is such a rare thing that, that we have this whole day to, to do this work and then the opportunities that this will avail for us to move forward. I'd like to start with introducing Dean Lisa Youngblade. So help, join me in welcoming Dean Youngblade. Good morning, buenos dias. Um, I'm Dean of the College of Health and Human Sciences, and I want to thank you on behalf of our college for being here today. And I especially want to thank um, Dr. Shillington and the School of Social Work for their leadership and commitment in really organizing and all the work they've done uh, so that we could be here today. So will you join me in thanking uh, Dr. Shillington and the school? So the work that you all are doing and cherishing today um, could not be more timely. You know this, you read the newspapers, many of you are here in the community, many of you are here at CSU. So it could not be more timely or more important to us as a campus, as a community, as a state, and as a nation. So I just wanna think about a couple of really important threads that tie this together and why it's really critical, optimal timing, and why I'm so excited about today. So we have multiple intersecting threads that really point to an imperative in this work. So at CSU, um, we know that our demographics are changing and our biggest growth in our diversity numbers is in the Latinx population. This is true in our college as well and mirrored in our community. And in fact, looking down the road, CSU has a real opportunity to be poised to be a Hispanic serving institution. So it's important that we're thinking about how we serve our students, our faculty, our staff, and our community at this time. It's also true, we have another intersecting thread that's really important here. And folks that are at CSU um, are keenly aware that mental and behavioral health issues and needs among students um, and really this is arguably relevant to everybody at CSU, is rising. We see this in capacity at the Student Health Network, but also in the many, many other ways we support students. This is the number one thing we hear about from academic support coordinators is how do we support not just the academic mission and academic growth of our students, but holistically their behavioral and mental health as well. So both of these issues, these changing demographics, the increasing needs for mental health and behavioral health support are present here at CSU, they're present here in our community, and in fact, our state and nation. But I think what's also really critical in this conversation, and why, again, I'm so excited about the topics that will be discussed today and the work that um, is being done, is this awareness of health and healthcare disparities. These two are well documented. I know you'll be talking about them today. And why I'm excited about this and the work that we're doing is because of pulling us all together to work towards a solution. So on, the, on behalf of, of the college, um, we've prioritized in our strategic planning the areas of mental and behavioral health and the commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I want you to know that the work that you're doing fits tremendously with the work that we're doing as a college and we're looking to you to help us continue in our strategic planning. So we've elevated this as really critical issues. We have an extraordinary opportunity to make an impact because we have three really important assets. The most important are the students that we train. We're in the business we are at CSU because we care about us training students. So providing them with um, really great um, education about mental and behavioral health in concert or in connection with uh, culturally appropriate care is incredibly important. But these students are gonna go out into our communities, so not only are we thinking about them here at CSU, but what they'll take and what our future holds. So one asset, really important, um, is, our, is our students and our commitment to training them in the best possible ways. 
We talked about our commitment to inclusion and community and a core set of values related to equity. This permeates all we do. This permeates what you do. And third, as a land-grant institution, we are privileged, truly privileged, to have the opportunity to engage with the community. So I'm just curious, if you're here, and I know roles uh, intersect in this really nice Venn diagram, if you're here primarily because of your connection to CSU, can you raise your hand? And look around. Um, if you're here primarily because of your connection to the community, can you raise your hand? It's about equal. This is amazing. This is a true partnership, and I'm so excited about that. So I'm grateful for the passion, for the commitment, the brilliance, and I mean this both in an intellectual way, but also in the idea that brilliance shines a light on something, the illumination way, um, by the work that you're doing about the day that you're going to have, about the conversations, and not just the conversations, but the commitment to carry the work forward um, and the changes that that will herald. So I wish you, all of us, an awesome day, um, and thank you for the opportunity that I get to welcome you. Now I also get the honor uh, to introduce uh, Johanna Uyoa who is the Community Services Manager at Poudre River, the Poudre River Public Library. Um, many, if not all of you, know her either through her connections to CSU or her work in the community. I'm grateful that you're here, Johanna, and welcome. Buenos dias a todos. Good morning. I've been trying not to print out the stuff that I'm using, so it's really good for the environment, but then I look very clunky when I'm doing stuff like this, so bear with me. I'm gonna try to not mess up the PowerPoint. The National Alliance on Mental Health NAMI in a recent statement remind us that the mental health conditions do not discriminate based on race, color, gender, identity that anyone can experience the challenges of mental health illness, illness regardless of their background. Their statement says that however, your concern or experiences and how you understand and cope with these conditions may be different. The statement seeks to remind us that cultural differences are of importance when seeking to understand and treat such mental illnesses, specifically with Latinx families. And still, to me, this statement leaves the burden of difference to the one with less power. In my welcome, I seek to add another layer to the equation of health in Latinx families, and that is to treat mental health illnesses specifically, having into consideration systems that in the first place could create those illnesses. I seek to add another layer to the equation, and that is the systems that exacerbate and in specific cases actually create some, such mental illness. Also, a system that makes it difficult to seek help. Because to address health disparities in the Latinx communities without addressing daily impact of white supremacy, oppression, discrimination, and racism is at best naive, incomplete, and at worst, very dangerous specifically when providing therapeutic treatments. I have a new therapist myself, and she's an immigrant like me. And the way taken away from the dynamic by having someone who understands in her bones the migratory process has been invaluable. It is life-changing, and some, for some of us, it's very easy to see the correlation with providing services to LGBTQ plus individuals by LGBTQ plus practitioners. It is easy to see the benefits of a provider that deeply understands that lives experience. Yet, when we come to talk about race and ethnicity, such considerations become problematic. Rimamanda Nochi Adishi reminds us in the danger of a single story what is the problem with that single story specifically in literature? She reminds us the danger of creating stories of scarcity and insufficiency. In Larimer County, we are all too familiar with the narrative of Latinx families who are unwilling to seek help, or families that are reluctant clients, Latinx individuals that are not concerned with their mental health or the mental health of the family members. And if you are a Latinx person here in Larimer County, if you are with the community, in community, you know that nothing can be further from the truth. 
Those statements are real only if you are in a position of power and willing to see the system of oppressions that in many cases created those illnesses in the first place. Dr. Sayas, in a recent interview with NPR, made a very obvious connection and correlation between the current concentration camps and the separation practices between parents and children as the creation and the origin of mental health illnesses for the children that have been directly affected. That makes sense, right? It's very logical correlation to make. But let's fast forward time and imagine one of those children as an adult trying to seek help with a practitioner in this country who is not prepared to center those systems of oppression, who, center, who is not prepared to center the experience of being an immigrant in the current America. And please know that this is not a simplistic view of mental health illnesses. We also have people with different diagnoses in our country of origin. We also have methods to help and assist. We also have created and used a resiliency framework to, to deal with poverty, violence, census, and endless wars. The key piece of my welcome is to allow the possibility for practitioners to weigh the real consequences for Latinx bodies, minds, and soul to simply exist in current America, to center in their therapeutic spaces the way that racism, microaggression, oppression, racism has. Also, to invite coworkers in position of power to consider the way that those system has in biracial, indigenous, and people of color that are your coworkers, that are mental health providers. Sometimes we suffer those microaggressions in the very workplace. Racism, discrimination is everywhere. I also want to invite you to consider different paradigms and practices that foster mental health. To invite academia to teach different methods of promoting social determinants of health in our communities by our communities to ponder about policies and laws that are detrimental to Latinx families here or in the workplace. I am beyond elated and so thankful for the department to give us the opportunity and a day to ponder mental health centering the Latinx experience in this country and to have the spaces to discuss the possibility of different approaches of together creating a different story. Thank you so much. So I was wondering, what should I say? I'm not an expert in Latinx mental health. I'm not an expert in immigration. You will hear that from all the people that are gonna come after me and the person who came before me. So I'm kind of sandwiched between experts. So when I was thinking about this yesterday, <clears throat> I thought, well, maybe it's important to find out how we got here. So Johanna did a great job of her paintbrush and painting a picture for us in terms of where we are, where we need to go. Well, here today, for the rest of the day, the tools to help us get there, how to build the pathway, how to lay the stones for the road. But for me, it was more like, well, maybe we need to remind ourselves that the way it is right now is not the way it always has been. And that gives me hope for change. So I'm going to read this. <clears throat> My apologies for not having it memorized, but I would be fearful of not getting it right. Um, so the current immigration policies are the latest in a long journey of US government's patterns of inviting and then reversing course to deport migrants. When the US agricultural economy needed laborers to fill work shortages in the early 1900s, there was a large push to establish the first guest worker program to fill those needs. As migration from Europe declined, the US increasingly turned to Mexico to fill the void by bringing in more than 70,000 Mexican workers to the US providing Mexican migrants with temporary legal status that lasted for decades. But in the late 1920s and the 1930s, 
as the U.S. attempted to rebuild itself after the Great Depression, more than 50,000 Mexican-American immigrants, including those who had become U.S. citizens and their U.S. citizen children, were rounded up and sent back to Mexico, known as the Mexican Repatriation. This was racially motivated program to create jobs for non-immigrants. This targeted effort consisted of raids in cities that were heavily populated by Latinx people and resulted in the deportation by trains loads and bus loads of thousands of Mexican Americans who were sent to regions of Mexico irregardless of where their family had originated. In 1929, Congress passed a law which made entering the U.S. without authorization a criminal misdemeanor. The law originally constructed by Senator Coleman Livingston Blees, a white supremacist who also defended lynching and segregation, and the then Secretary of Labor, James Davis, who oversaw immigration under the department, was done with two goals in mind, deterrence and punishment. Between 1920 and 1930, close to 7,000 illegal entry and re-entry entrants were prosecuted under this new law. Immigration policy during this period re-articulated that the U.S.-Mexican border was a cultural and racial boundary, and it was the first to create illegal immigration. In the 40s and continuing into the 60s, the U.S. government reopened its doors and invited close to 400,000 temporary workers from Mexico through this series of bilateral agreements between Mexico and the United States, and it became known as the Bracero Program. But since the 60s, and particularly in the 1990s, U.S. immigration policy has increasingly become more strict. Scholars have documented that these stricter immigration controls have been pushed by xenophobic reactions to non-white immigrants. The enforcement of these policies is always at the discretion of the President of the United States and his administration, and has been applied in varying degrees of intensity. From 1996 to 2000, the Clinton administration and the early Bush administration had only about 20,000 a year of prosecutions under this law. But in November of 2002, Congress passed the Homeland Security Act, officially creating the Department of Homeland Security, giving power to refer the prosecution of immigrants. In 2009, the Obama administration continued with increasing immigration prosecutions. And in 2013, at its peak, prosecuted over 95,000 violation cases in a single year. In 2016, the criminal prosecutions for immigration violations accounted, now listen to this number. In 2016, the criminal prosecutions for immigration violations accounted for 52% of all federal criminal prosecutions. At present, the overwhelming majority of persons crossing the southern border are people of color, primarily from Latin America. Border Patrol data about arrests at the U.S. borders from 2015 to 18 show that over 830,000 individuals were arrested, the great majority of whom were arrested at the southern border. Of the people arrested at the border, 64% were from Mexico, 13% from Guatemala, 9% from El Salvador, and 8% from Honduras. On April 6, 2018, then Attorney General Jeff Sessions issued the Zero Tolerance Policy Memorandum for attempted entry or re-entry in the United States along the southwest border. This Zero Tolerance Policy criminalized the act of asylum seeking. Adults are detained in adult criminal facilities and their children are, consequently, transferred separately to warehouse-like facilities. Zero tolerance has resulted in the separation of thousands of migrant children, including infants and toddlers, from their parents, converted them to unaccompanied minors, and forced them into shelters for six to eight months or longer. 
These policies that have driven immigration control efforts have resulted in trauma and its long-term effects on individuals, families, and the communities. We know that many of the immigrant families crossing our borders are seeking refuge or asylum from atrocities and unlivable circumstances in their home countries. The practice of separating children from their families compounds their trauma, causes irreparable damage, and is a violation to human rights. In addition to the harm caused to the children and their families, these practices do and will continue to have an impact and consequences rippling throughout our society. I'd like to just end with a quote from Man Nelson Mandela. No one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin, background, or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they learn to hate, they can also be learned to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. Thank you. So I'd like to now introduce Miguel Cruz, who is the Associate Director for the National Hispanic and Latino Mental Health Technology Transfer. Join me in welcoming Miguel. Welcome, everybody. Uh, buenos dias. Good morning. I need some energy. Good morning. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> uh, well, Audrey, Thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, Colorado State University for having us uh, during this uh, day. Uh, we know that we're going to have a very exciting moments uh, and very good presenters are going to, uh, you know, uh, being in their peak right now. They have a lot of information to share, but one of the things, you know, before starting in this uh, presentation is to present ourselves at the technology transfer centers. So one of the things that I really like to know is how many of you have heard about the technology transfer centers before? Raise your hand. Just a few. So this is a, an excellent opportunity for you to understand what is the technology transfer centers. Uh, so this is, this is part of our, our map. Uh, we are right now, we started in 1993. Uh, under the Addiction Technology Transfer Centers, funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. And then they uh, pointed out and discovered that this model uh, is a very effective way to develop the workforce that provides services uh, to the, you know, to the, to the, the addiction uh, um, field. So they realize that they have to come with some other information specifically for the mental health providers and for those that are in the prevention side. So they develop this huge uh, network infrastructure that right now we are uh, part of it. And uh, as you can see, the, the, the structure is very specific and very similar for those three centers is about 10 regional centers that represent the HHS regions. There are two national focus area centers, one focus on Hispanic and Latino, and the other is on the Native American population. And the other one is the uh, national office, which puts everything together. So our role specifically uh, is to serve as a, as a key subject matter expert and key resource for the workforce and communities seeking uh, to address mental illness, prevention treatment, recovery support, in order to reduce first health disparities uh, among the Hispanic Latino population. We all work to reduce health disparities, but in our case, what we are focused specifically on the Hispanic Latino population as, as we are now transitioning to the Latinx uh, population across the United States and the territories. We perform this type of work by partnership and collaboration like this. Uh, we work with consumers, uh, government officials, family organizations, and all of this uh, infrastructure in order to provide these services and make it available for everyone at the, you know, at, you know that, that really needed uh, specifically. 
One of the other things right now is that besides our focus, uh, right now we have a school mental health uh, based project. Uh, this is our second year of this supplement and yesterday we found out that we were extended another year. So if you are interested in receiving uh, some trainings around uh, school based mental health, uh, we are more than welcome to have a conversation with all of you. Uh, we have, you have been seeing you know, all the staff uh, and we can approach uh, at any time so we don't bite. So we want you to come here with us and engage in this conversation. And actually this is part of one of the examples. This is just one conversation one of the networks started talking about and we all realized you know, this is something that is important and we are all together here, uh, which is great. And it's over 100 uh, participants right now, so just to let you know. So I think uh, this is very good. And I think we deserve some kind of, of applause for that because we, <laughs> are you know, doing something for the community and we are uh, uh, looking forward to reduce somehow the health disparities. Uh, this is our, some of our educational products that we have in our website. Uh, you can download it, those are free. Uh, as long uh, as well as some of the training opportunities that we have, not just for the Hispanic and Latino TTC, but for other centers as well. You can enter at the, at the TTC network and you can access a ton of information uh, for, for you to download. And specifically, this is our uh, particular information. This is a picture of our staff. Uh, there's always, you know, there, you know, we are a team, now you are part of our family, but we can just have a big picture, but sometime we are gonna have a picture of everyone here, so that's gonna be exciting. Uh, so, but this is information about ourselves. This is a website that you can access specifically for our information. This is our email, uh, Hispanic Latino Mental uh, MHTTC Network.org. This is our phone number, and very important that you can follow us uh, on the social media. We are. Uh, on YouTube, we are in LinkedIn, we are on Facebook and Twitter, and you can find us at Gila uh, MHTTC. Uh, for, these for this particular presentation, for this particular symposium, we want you to remember the hashtag for today's presentation, of today's activity, which is LatinxHD2020. So, uh, it is very uh, important for us that you can share information using this and, uh, uh, and be bold. Take, take opportunity of this, uh, of this time, learn, uh, engage with people, engage with the presenters, engage with one another and create networks. That is one of the important uh, aspects for this uh, conference. And one of the things is that if you are starting using this hashtag and you start posting, we, at the end of the presentation, we have a special gift for you. So be bold, again, you know, post specifically. Maybe we can see the first people that uh, share some picture or that write some comment or something like that. But we are going to let you know at the end. So we expect that you uh, stay all together. But if you can't stay uh, during the whole day because you are classes or you are faculty and you have to do uh, some, some, some teaching, uh, we, ask you, and Angel is going to talk about that, we are, uh, we have um, some uh, evaluations. So these forms are very important for us to continue the work that we're doing. So if you are leaving uh, before the, 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 uh, the activity ends, please seek one of these evaluation forms and hand it over in the registration table. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity. And now I'll let you with Angel Casillas. Thank you. Morning. So Miguel try to ring you up a little bit. Uh, it's gonna be a long day for us, so it's good to keep our hope, uh, our energies up. So my name is Angel Casillas. Like Miguel said, I am the project manager for the National Hispanic and Latino Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, and I'm gonna present to you guys our first keynote speaker, who is Dr. Sayas, and also I'll be talking about some household items. The bathrooms are all the way to the end, to the right or to the left. Uh, we also be having two breaks in the morning, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So uh, be sure to uh, be aware of that. We're also doing lunch at 12 
uh, lunches on your own. Uh, please, uh, we'll need you back here at one so we can be on a timely matter and finish early if we can. Uh, our first keynote speaker uh, who's gonna be delighting you in this morning is Dr. Luis Sayas, who is Dean of the Steve Hicks School of Social Work and the Robert Lee Sutherland Chair in Mental Health and Social Policy at the University of Texas in Austin. In a career spanning over 40, 40 years, he has been a clinical, a clinical researcher and an advocate for disadvantaged ethnic and racial minorities, families, and children. So with anything, without anything else, I leave you with Dean Sayas. You know, I, I appreciate the brief introduction so I have more time to talk to you. So thank you very much, Angel. And um, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Dean Youngblade for, the, for, the, uh, for having us here today uh, and for allowing us to spend some time with you and tell, tell you something about what we do. And also to my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Shillington, whom I've known for several years now as we travel the, the, the Dean's circuit and in social work, uh, Dean's and Director circuit in social work, and it's, it's great. And thank you very much also for that lead-in, because it certainly helps uh, 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 to lead into my talk. And um, what I'd like to start out with is saying that we, I will be covering some, some aspects of the, the issue facing Hispanics, Latinos here in the United States. And I think it's important to know that it's, immigration is not the only issue we deal with, but rather that we, like everyone else, are concerned about education, healthcare, housing, jobs, you know, criminal justice, or, or justice, put it that way. Um, and so you will hear a lot uh, across, across today. And mine just happens to be a small snippet of the issues that we face in the United States today. And uh, so I appreciate uh, Dr. Shillington's uh, description of, of the history. And I want to just also tell you that in my presentation, I'll, I'll have some pictures and some videos that might be upsetting. And uh, so I, I tell you that so that you'll know uh, to pull out the, if, if it's troubling, you can leave the room. Uh, or you can just pull out the hankies and the Kleenex, uh, but I'll try to do something else. Can I get the other view on here? Can I do this? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to have people with some tech experience. Uh, anyway, so what I want to talk to you about today is the work that I've, from the work that I've been doing since 2014, when we first had uh, the largest surge of mothers and children in particular entering the United States from the Northern Triangle countries in Central America, of uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And um, it's at that time that I became very involved. I had been doing work on what happens to the US citizen children of undocumented uh, immigrants whose parents are deported. So that was some earlier work that I've been doing both research and, and uh, advocacy work with attorneys. And then in 2014, when, when the, the concentration camps or the detention centers, or they're called quaintly family residential centers uh, for children and, and mothers um, were created, I began to get involved with attorneys to work and bring the behavioral science uh, side to things. So, um, uh, which way does this, oh, I think it's the wrong button. What, what do I aim at? <laughs> Maybe I'll just use the, the old, okay, how about this? There, okay, so here's what I wanna talk about today. Thank you, I'll leave that aside. I wanna talk to you and tell you what I've heard from the many families um, that I've met over the years about what happens during the, what, why, they, why they leave their countries. So the, talk about the pre-migration trauma that they're facing, the gangs, the violence, some of which uh, Dr. Shillington mentioned. Then I wanna talk to you about what I've heard from families who are in transit. When they trek through Mexico, 1,800 miles, you know, pulling along children, being led by coyotes, uh, the sort of things that they experience. And then talk about the post-migration trauma. And then I'll spend a little more time on that because those are the children that you as clinicians will see, teachers will have in your classrooms, 
physicians and, and, and nurse practitioners will have in your, in your clinics. Uh, and then we'll talk about what we can, we can do about that. I understand I have plenty of time. I learned last night that I can speak slowly today because it's more time than I thought I was gonna have. Um, these are the images that we're probably all familiar with, that we've seen uh, in newspapers of the, the level of violence that is now endemic to, to Central America. And it's, it's hard for us to imagine this level of violence. Even our um, traumatic symptom scales don't capture the enormity of this uh, level of trauma. Right? Where you're seeing it, you're living it, and it's not just what you see, but the fear. And I look at these pictures and I think about you know, the suffering that these, these folks have. Look at the little girl in the middle picture at the top and the one on the, your far left, I guess. Um, what that must they be going through? What, what are they thinking as they see dead bodies around them or a dead body? And look how young they are. This is what they're exposed to day in and day out. And then the pain of mothers, the pain of mothers in the other three pictures of, of losing someone they love, a child more often than not, or a spouse or friend. Uh, it's, it really is the kind of uh, violence that they, are, that they are fleeing. And so it, it's, it's not hard to empathize with, with families when you get to meet them. And so we know, and there's been some great research out of South Africa talking about what it's like to witness death, what it's like to see a dead body, I mean, right there, or even, a, or even watching someone get be seriously injured. You know, uh, to this day, as I was preparing for this, I recall back in the, the 1970s when I was at graduate school in Manhattan, seeing um, in, an instant after a young dental student from Columbia struck by a car and killed right on Broadway. And it's still with me today because though I was just a, some, time, some distance away, it still, it still stayed with me and it has been a traumatic effect, has had traumatic effect on me over the years because I can remember that, that time. It was probably one of the worst I've seen, I've seen others. But, um, and we do know that witnessing death is probably the largest burden of having PTSD, right? So it's not, so you may have many other things, but when you talk about witnessing death or this sort of serious injury, it really does um, account for more of the PTSD symptoms than, than, uh, than other, other things. And we do know that it adds to long symptom duration when you've seen that. The trauma doesn't go away quickly. Um, the way we might if we have an, automo uh, an accident that weekend and within a week we're pretty much over it unless it's really fatal or tragic. And so the symptoms remain for a long time. We know it affects our memory, right? And, and the, the helplessness that is part of the origins of PTSD are, are there in witnessing. And so then that, that level of witnessing affects our memory, it forms the memories that we have about the traumatic event. And that's when we get intrusive and vivid, you know, intrusive thoughts, memories, so-called flashbacks, and, and things like that. It's that sort of power that it, it that takes. And of course, as we know, it's more distressing when you have multiple traumas. And the children we've, we're talking about have had multiple traumas. They haven't seen one death, they've seen multiple deaths. They haven't seen one assault on the street, they've seen many, or they've been victim of them, of it themselves. So Danny, Danny was a boy that I evaluated in 2014 in a, um, in Carn City, Texas. And he, and this is one of the first family residential centers, moms and children. And I was there with a group of lawyers from the National Youth Law Center, and I was doing the, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the behavioral science end of it. And for one of the, the attorneys, she was handling the, the asylum case for Danny and his mother and older brother. So Danny was about seven when I met him. And um, I asked him to draw what it was like. So Danny drew these pictures of the violence in his town. By the way, um, since I didn't have permission from the family to use the pictures, I forged them. So what I did is I redrew them in my own way, but pretty much uh, uh, depicting what Danny, uh, what Danny gave me. In his town, they called the gang members the Revos Locos, the Revos Locos. 
Um, I tried to look that up, and I knew that it was a, it was a rock band some time ago, but, um, but for them, it was the, the dangerous characters. I said to Danny, what makes them you know, bad guys? Well, he said, they smoke cigarettes. And they carry guns, and they drink beer, and that makes them bad guys. And they shoot. They shoot at birds, and they shoot at people. And in the picture here, Danny's showing me how terrorized the sun is in his village, in his town. They set uh, uh, houses on fire. They kill people. See, at the bottom right, someone's in a casket or, or, or some sort. And uh, these are what the guys do, um, the revos locos. So this is, this is going on. Uh, he, he draws this for me. And then I asked what happened to him. And he drew this picture. So this is when that violence that was outside came into his home or into his family. So he's telling me about the day that his uncle was killed by the Revos Locos. And you'll see that here on the left, the guy with the bleeding head, uh, the stick figure with the bleeding head, that was his uncle. And he said he heard about it, and he ran over to his uncle's house, because they apparently, the way he drew this, it, it seemed like they must have lived on the side of a, a small hill, and they each had their home. So distances with little kids, you can't, you know, you don't know if it's 50 yards away or 100 yards away, but uh, they were all within walking distance of one another. His grandparents are at the top, and the son is equally horrified here as well. That day, these intruders came into his uncle's home and shot him and killed him for whatever the beef was, I don't know. And Danny ran over to see um, his uncle, and he described to me seeing his uncle's teeth coming out, of the, coming out of the back of his head because he had been shot in the face. When a seven-year, by the way, and he was seven when he told me that, but it actually happened when he was six because then they, they set off the, the, the migrant trail. That's what Danny was exp experiencing at that moment his uncle being shot, his mother and father down at the bottom right, uh, his mother was really distressed, she's crying, she's weeping, she's you know, thrashing about on the floor, whatever, and his grandparents are alarmed because they've lost their son. Several, you know, sometime after that, um, Danny, one of those Revos Locos beat Danny up, beat Danny up pretty severely. He was only six years old, he's being beat up. Maybe that time he was, actually he was seven years old when one of those Revos Locos beat him up, a teenage, Revos Loco, and um, beat him up. And um, at that point, the family said, we've got to leave. We've got to get out of here. You know, otherwise, they're going to kill us. So Danny, his older brother, his mom, and his father set out. The, there's a problem, though. And as you see at the bottom, his dad is a single-leg amputee with crutches. And so they set out uh, from Honduras. They set out. But he couldn't, the father couldn't keep up with them because he, he had the, the crutches and he couldn't carry much and that sort of thing. And they set out, they tried it twice. On the second time, they, he just said, I can't make it. So he said to his wife, take our sons, take our boys, and save them. And so the father stayed back. And the, and the mom uh, made it with the two boys to the border and then was uh, placed in detention. But that's the kind of violence that Danny experienced. That's what caused them to leave. And many of the families told me, we didn't want to leave. We had our ranch, our farm, our little store, but between the violence and the extortions that they were facing, there was nothing you could do. So they set off. When I met Danny, he had not heard about his father. He, had not, he didn't know what had happened to his father. And it's very likely that his father was killed because when you try to leave and you can't, they know you've tried to leave, the Maraviri, well, the, the gangsters in this case, the Devil's Logos, they will, they will take you out. That's the kind of trauma that I began to see and have seen, seen very much since uh, in the evaluations that I've, that I've done of these children and their families. And my evaluations are intended to help the attorneys in the asylum, uh, asylum hearings. So they leave, they leave that experience, and then they enter Mexico. And one of the things they told me about was, who do we trust? Who do we trust along the way? Is that nice, you know, nice-looking, sweet-looking old lady by the church, can we trust her to ask for directions or where we can eat or where we can stay the night? How about the policeman on the street? How about the vendor that we buy our, you know, our ice eh, piraguas, whatever they're called in, in Central America, the, the, the snow cones, snow cones. You know, can we trust that person? So you're, going, you're, you're traveling, but you don't know who you can trust. You might have uh, entrusted your money and your lives to a coyote, 
but will that person be scrupulous or not? And by the way, there are scru scrupulous coyotes who do what they were paid to do, but there are many that aren't. Um, the criminals, the organized gangs, I heard of families who were kept in, in um, uh, not even safe houses, but dungeons for two weeks while more money was brought from their families, was sent from their families, or other, other people were able to give money. Um, they witnessed violence and death. The children could tell me about cadavers or, or, or you know, uh, that they saw along the way, or the remains, human remains. Um, they were intimidated, physically assaulted, sexually assaulted. Um, the, it, was, it was a terrible, terrible, uh, uh, in, in just about every instance, to travel through Mexico under these conditions. And as I mentioned, they, they do, they, at times, are imprisoned by the gangs and by the coyotes themselves. And so there's constant danger and depravity. That's what you're, you're, you're experiencing for, for the 1,800 miles or so that brings you up to McAllen, Texas. Some of the stories I heard, and by the way, um, we have a research project going now that, uh, in which we're looking at children who have spent time in detention. And I spent the summer, well, it seemed like the entire summer, but a lot of the summer at the bus depot in San Antonio, Texas meeting families who had just been released either by Customs and Border Protection or, or ICE from the detention camp. Now, I just wanted to share something about what these families uh, told me. Uh, and these were just, you know, there, it's a large room like this. They're all milling about. The mothers are seated. The fathers are seated, you know, trying to do what adults do. And the kids are just running around. It was, it's beautiful to see because they feel so safe. Um, so I sat down with, with a mom, and, uh, and she's telling me that, uh, actually, we have a transcript. She, this is from our study. She's telling us that she traveled, she left their home in Guatemala, just fine. They took a bus, and they took another bus, and took another bus, and took another bus, until they got to just outside of El Paso, Texas. No problems whatsoever. They knew all the buses to take, and it managed. It was when they arrived in El Paso that the trauma began, because they crossed over the border, and there was an opening in the fence, and there was a a gardener or someone who saw them, spied them, and, and saw the, the mom and sons, and he went, something like, come on over here. And he, he opened up a part of the, of the fence where they could get into. And they walked right down into downtown El Paso. And uh, it was there that um, uh, uh, a man uh, uh, accosted them and said, you don't belong here. You don't belong in this country. Now, how he could identify that they didn't belong in this country, considering what El Paso looks like, if you know it's a very brown city. Um, how he would have known, but that's when they got caught. And then they spent the next three days in an outdoor um, holding area that held about 3,000 people where you couldn't lay down. And she said, that's when we began to have these traumatic experiences. The way we were treated by the U.S. government agencies, the people that we thought would at least give us food, shelter, something to drink, and give us a chance to survive. So that was one of, of, the, of the things. Uh, the stories I heard. Another mother this past summer telling us about um, how she came with her 13-year-old daughter and uh, like a nine-year-old son, maybe who's probably more like seven years old. And they managed to, to get through, through Mexico. But there was a moment at which the coyote had them on the back of a truck, a flatbed truck. And uh, for some reason or other, they saw the police or the, mil uh, the military coming after them, so they told everyone to get off the flatbed and hide. But they didn't wait for people to move as people move. They don't move instantly. So they pushed the 13-year-old off, and she broke her leg. And it sounded to me from the description as a compound fracture of her ankle. And when I met her at the bus depot, by this time she had gotten medical care, and she had a nice looking cast, the kind of cast most of you skiers have, have had at one point or another. Um, and so, you know, I knew at that point, but they, they tell me, she tells me that they were thrown off that bus. Her daughter um, broke her leg severely, and she said that there were three angels, three men from El Salvador, who carried the girl for what could have been miles to the nearest farmhouse, where they rubbed her leg and the bone back into place. They made a splint and a cast of their own making, and were able to travel on. And it was at the time that she got to the border that CBP, Customs and Border Protection agents, saw her and immediately pulled her out of the line so that they could take the child to, to get that cast that I told you about. What's more is that this mom didn't, uh, she also told me without telling me that she was sexually assaulted. At one moment, she tells us in, in the ride, 
All the women, about 12, 14 women, were on the bus with their children. All the adult women were brought out. And she said, and all the, and she took this third person stand. She said, all of the women were, were raped. And two were kept. The rest were put back on the bus and continued on. So she was one of those, but she didn't, she didn't tell me directly. I learned of another family whose father had gotten to Virginia. This is a mom with two uh, teenage sons. And that dad um, had managed to memorize which buses where in Mexico would take you to what part of the next town. So he had memorized it. So he told his sons, and they, they carried a, a cell phone with them along the way. He said, when you get to this little corner, you're going to see a little this and that. And there's the, the, the M3 bus is going to be taking you to the next town. That's the one you get. And you get off where, the, where there's a petrol station over here and manage to get them to the border just by that kind of ingenuity and resourcefulness because the father knew exactly how to get them there. That was fascinating to, to hear. Uh, the woman who told me she spent two, two weeks in a dungeon, uh, that's being held by coyotes, where they, no water, running water, I mean, unbathed, um, no uh, toilet facilities, and you're being held there until other people paid ransom. And then this summer I heard again of the, of the, from the teenage boy who was, there, who was crossing the Rio Grande with his mother and, the, the, and, and they decided we've got to go through the water and find our way across. And the mother started losing her grip and this 14, 15 year old boy is holding on to his mother and he's, he's saying, hold on mom, hold on, hold on. They were both going to die and the mom was about to let go. But the son was saying, no mommy, no, no, mama, you know, let's, let's hang on, hang on. Um, and they managed to make it. There, the Customs and Border protection boats were around them. And in many instances, they just let people perish. In this case, these, these uh, uh, border protection agents came over and helped them out. But they were almost certain to be doomed to the waters of the Rio Grande. So it was, you know, you hear these stories and you can't imagine what it is. You know, this, this past fall, um, my daughter gave birth to a premature baby, only a month premature, and it was difficult for us to imagine our little baby in the hospital in the hands of someone else. And that's nothing. That's a hardship for us Americans. High level care that came up to $80,000 uh, that you know, my daughter will have to, and then son-in-law will pay, be paying off. But we worry about that when in fact, we have people who are suffering much more than any hardship we could ever imagine. And we have to think about our empathy. So those are the stories of the migration through, through Mexico. And that adds to that kind of layering, if you will, the piling on of trauma. And then they arrive in the United States. And what happens, for those of you who don't know, what happens first upon arrival and you're apprehended, whether at a checkpoint, uh, which means it's going to be ICE, or in between, uh, uh, which will be Customs and Border Protection, the first thing you do is you're going to put in a, be put in a hielera, an ICE box, fittingly, because ICE is the acronym for Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So you're put in these places where there are about 30 people here, three pictures, some of them from the uh, Department of Homeland Security Inspector General. There are moms, these are folks who have been walking for days, who haven't had a chance to bathe or a good meal, and for 72 hours they're kept in these places that are nothing more than old, like, you know, the, the locker rooms of our high school with tiles and, you know, uh, fluorescent lights, kept on 24 hours a day, temperature at about 55 degrees AC, um, and you're held there. And you're not able to, to bathe. They don't give you that. And they give you these sandwiches, two pieces of bread, and a slice of bologna or something for 72 hours, children and moms. And in, you see in each of these pictures, you see the water that they're provided in the back and the cups. But they're sitting on a ledge, right? That's a half wall. Behind that half wall is one toilet. So you're doing your business in the presence of 30 such people. That's, that's not the way people should be treated. Okay, so let me just tell you about the science rather than get onto my editorializing. Um, this, is, this is what they encountered during the first 72 hours. And so we're adding the trauma that these folks have experienced, now we're adding to it and we're, we're part of that, we as, as a government. From there, uh, oh, the, the other ones are, so, so these are hieleras, ice boxes, and these are perreras kennels. And you've heard about this, especially uh, 
kind of, kind of uh, places where, where families and unaccompanied minors were kept in the uh, old, uh, what is it, box stores that were emptied out in, in uh, was it Brownsville? There was a Walmart. That, it's that sort of thing where, where the kids are kept warm under these foil blankets uh, and they're separated from their parents. So this is, you know, we, we saw this start in 2014. It's not like it was the beginning of a migration process. It was just that it was the biggest surge at, at any one time. And so in, in the literature, in science, we know that there are two things that are really uh, terrible about detention. Uh, one is that there's deprivation, the element of deprivation in which the children don't have the experiences that a normal child would have, the developmentally ex expected experiences of riding a bike, right, outside with friends, hanging out till the, you know, the sun goes down and your moms are calling you in uh, because you're now playing under the only lamp on the street. You remember those, right? And your mom's calling you in. They don't have that experience. They are in these prisons where they're, they're um, their entire day is governed by, by staff, they're, they're actually prison guards. Um, so it's prison guards who, who dictate their lives. Mothers can't be mothers, parents can't be parents, because their authority as parents is taken from them. Now the authority is the prison, is the detention center. So it does do a lot of flipping of family dynamics, and I'll talk more about that later. But really, it deprives children of average expect accept uh, expectable experiences. The other element of, uh, of that detention trauma is the threat. There's always the threat of an immediate, ongoing possibility that your physical integrity, your, your psychological integrity, will be assaulted. Guards are not friendly people. And, um, well, let me just say this. Guards who are hired by private prison companies who run these uh, places uh, at a tune of about $400 per person per night, uh, so they're making a bundle, uh, the, the, they're, they're not kind people, and so they will have children, oh, you won't get out of here. Oh, we don't know when you're gonna get out of here. Nah, you're probably gonna be sent back to your town. Oh, uh, you don't know. We don't know what's gonna happen to your mommy. You might be able to stay, but your mommy can, you know, can't. It, and that's that constant you know, level of, of threat that the just uh, folks experience day in and day out. The detention centers in South Texas, the, the, the ones that have held families, are, are converted uh, county prisons or, or state prisons that were abandoned or, or, or shut down and were now refurbished to, to house these, uh, these families. They are prisons. In Carn City, Texas, where Danny was, you have prison walls, so they can't see over the 30-foot walls. So they, don't, they can't even see if somebody's driving by, what the kids in the neighborhood are doing. By the way, there's no neighborhood, because these are intentionally placed in remote locations in Texas so that the attorneys have a hard time to get to them. So these are like two hours outside of San Antonio, both of them, uh, the other, I'm sorry, the other one is Dilly, Dilly Texas. And those house uh, families, uh, mothers and, and children. They're intentionally kept at a distance so that lawyers, family members, anyone else, advocates, have a hard time getting to them. And then, um, so it's, and, and it also is the only job in town for many of the unemployed people. So they, they hire the local, the, the local folks, pay them perhaps minimum wage to, to be guards and whatnot. And in that way, they set up this dynamic of one, on, one oppressed group further oppressing another group. Uh, and it's, it's really difficult. And it's not to say that there aren't good people. There aren't good people. Uh, I had written a brief, or rather a, um, an affidavit. It's called a declaration for, the, for a federal class action lawsuit in which I, I wrote about the 20, 26 cases of families that I had uh, interviewed. And it was entered into the, the, the court, into the document. And you may have heard about it. Uh, Judge Dolly G in, in Los Angeles is the one that, that ruled that the U.S. government was out of compliance. Uh, it was in violation of the uh, Flores Agreement that was signed under the Clinton administration. And so in that, so it got, word got out that there had been this psychologist, social worker who had written this, this uh, thing. And, uh, and so I arrived that day to visit a family to interview them. And um, they were delaying, they, which is another tactic. So I'm scheduled to see a family at 10.30, I get there at 10. Then they, oh, 
your, your name's not on the list. Do you have the right documents? Let's see your ID card. All stuff you've provided already. Uh, and so they delay you so that then you're, you're going to see the family at 10.30. Well, it's now 11. And then you're being rushed because they have to go to lunch. Lunch is going to be served. Lunch, if they don't get the lunch, they don't have lunch until dinner. So it really is intended to, 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 uh, to make, make it so that they can't, the families can't get what they want. So I'm there waiting, and I'm complaining because I have privilege. Um, I'm complaining. And um, they finally bring a, 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 a supervisor out who's an ICE, an ICE super, uh, supervisor. And um, he says to me, Zayas, Zayas, aren't you the guy that wrote that report? I said, what report? I knew what he was talking about. What report? Well, he says it was a report um, about the number of families you saw and the conditions that they were in. I said, oh, yes, that was me. Where did you get that information? I said, I was here with the National Youth Law Service, whatever. Um, and I saw he had to have been in his late 30s, early 40s. And I said, man, you look like you're a father. How could you do this? How could you be here? And so he pulled me aside and said, let's go outside. So I thought, uh, OK, let's go outside. We're away from, uh, from ears. And he said, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up for this. He wanted to fight the bad guys bringing you know, uh, drugs and arms and stuff into the country, not to house mothers and kids. That's, so they are, you know, it's folks who are in untenable positions who have to do things that they would otherwise not do. So that's, that's what detention does. And you have to imagine that when I was, back in 2014, some of these families had been there for, for months, sometimes years. Perhaps in this next picture, yes. This is a little boy um, who was kept in a, in, in a detention center with his mom for two years. He was three years old. He was one year old when he arrived. Two thirds of his life had been spent in prison. And this is back in 2017 when he was released. His, mo his mother told us, or told the newspaper, he learned how to talk and walk there. That's where he learned everything. Look at this, his eyes. I mean, this is, this is when he was released from that prison. He had not seen anything. I mean, he had lived the, his toddler years as, as a prison inmate. By the way, at Hutto, another place in Texas, uh, a lawsuit was filed because they not only had the mothers in those prison suits, but they had baby, baby prison suits. So all the children were walking around with the stripes, the kind you see with the guys working on the, the, uh, the medians of our highways under the Department of Corrections uh, supervision. They had children, but that's another matter. I'm sorry, I, I could get into a lot of this. And in this case, uh, this little boy, had spent, what you see there is his first dinner outside of prison. The first time he had dined in a regular restaurant. Something that most of our, those of us here who have kids Shoot, we take them in those uh, fancy uh, things, uh, carriers that we plop into the car because they fit neatly and everything. And this boy at age three is dining in a restaurant for the first time in his life as a free child. And um, it does, it, it can't help but affect, affect you. Uh, and, and, that, and by the way, so there were, there were other, we had a girl who had uh, spent at least a quarter of her life in prison uh, in, another, in another case. Now, so all of this is going on. So the Obama administration starts the process. He, he deports and begins to incarcerate and detain more, more people than even his predecessor, George Bush. Trump took it to the next level, of course, as we, as we all know. And it was, in, excuse me, While we had the, the family separation, remember, in the spring of 2018, it was a big, big to-do. And the, really, the US said, wait a minute, the people of the US said, wait, we can't be separating children. We learned later that it had already started quietly the year before, in 2017, when the government, in March of that year, was considering the zero tolerance policy that you all read about, and that family separation would be one of those. In November of 2017, the Houston Chronicle reported that um, the government had already quietly been separating kids from their families long before it came to public light in the spring and summer of 2018. So you see here the, the and by the way, there's a, you know, this, this timeline is, is vaster, but I just gave you some highlights. So in June, finally DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, admits that it separated 2,000 kids just within the span of one month from their parents. 
And then under that pressure, that, that uprising, if you will, among mothers, especially, and, 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 and just good American citizens, the president says, okay, we're not gonna have any more uh, separation. And then that, and at that same time, we learned that another 2,000 and such kids had been separated between May 5th and, and June 9th. So while they're admitting to this, they're still de uh, uh, separating kids. And then that's when a federal judge, um, Sagnow, I think his name's Sagnow, um, ruled that you, know, you have to reunite families within 30 days and kids under five within two weeks. It didn't happen, it happened for many of them, but there were still families being separated at the border. And then last year, about this time last year, the inspector general uh, found that thousands more families had been separated than previously known. And the exact number was unknown because they didn't have a tracking system. There will be children who will never see their families again. Parents who will never see their children again. And will probably enter our foster care system, be adopted. Um, but these are children who, have, who will have suffered that separation of trauma. Isn't there were stories of, you know, in one case, uh, I think it was in, in Houston, um, a mother who was actually breastfeeding her little daughter had the child taken from her as she's breastfeeding the baby. That's the kind of inhumanity that, that occurred that summer. Um, so I want to take a, bring you to a closer look. How am I doing for time? I'm good? I'm talking too fast. I just slowed down. I'll tell you some other stories. But um, we, we have to think about um, what the damage is. As clinicians and as researchers, it's not just enough to know the policies of our country or what's going on. But when we think about what actually happens to children, and, and it could be teenagers uh, too, I, I, numerous teenagers that I interviewed. Um, one of my favorites was the poet, as I called him. Uh, and this was at Carn City, Texas, where the mothers and children uh, under age 12 were kept, the moms could be in a cell with their children. It usually was like three families per cell. But the teenage boys would be housed in a separate part of the prison and teenage girls on another. So you have like boys upstairs, girls downstairs, or the reverse. And this young man, um, who is now somewhere, I think, in Oregon um, or Washington State, uh, was telling me about um, the conditions that he was living under. And it was, it was you know, he told me the stories about the, 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 the killings in his, in his um, uh, in his town, there was also the the, uh, uh, the vigilantes who had uh, sombra negra, the black shadow, I guess, who were guys on the right side of the law taking out the gang members, uh, literally taking them out, and that was you know he he heard the learned of the experience and saw some bodies of of some of those Mara uh, uh, gang members who had been. Uh, uh, killed by the vigilantes. And I, and I asked him how he survived uh, through being uh, in, in, now there had been months in detention. He said, I read. He said he was reading the great American, uh, Latin American writers. You know, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Gabriela Mistral, Pablo Neruda, Octavio Paz, all of these great writers. And that's what he did. And I said, a teenage boy with seven other teenage boys in a cell, what must that be like? And I asked him, and he said, well, they made fun of me. For the first month, they was, oh man, look at what you know teenage boys would be if you're, if you're a reader type. Um, but then he was memorizing quotes from the, from the, from the authors. And he was, when, when one would say, some, some kid in the room would say, oh, I got a hangnail, he would say, you know what Octavio Paz would say about that? And then he'd, he'd memorize a poem and tell something else. You know, something that would be pithy to the, to the, to the moment. And so, I, I, and, and he said, but by doing that enough, one guy started reading along with him, and the other guy started reading, and before you know it, all eight boys, teenage boys, were reading the great Latin American writers um, as a way to survive and to cope with the, the, the deprivation and the threats and that of detention. It's remarkable, kind of the human spirit for resilience and, and life and life affirming. Um, I gave him my card and I said, if you want to apply to the University of Texas, you let me know. I'll make sure we, we get you in and we'll give you a scholarship. Uh, I never heard from him. He's probably at Colorado State 
with an honor student here. Um, so, so we've had, you know, we've had those. And, and again, other teenagers who had experienced the, the difficulty of, of being um, of, of their home country and then of the trek through Mexico, of course, and what happened uh, to them in detention and afterwards. And the trauma is there. Now, let's think developmentally, right? So the younger the child, the less cognitive, uh, they, uh, the, the less cognitive, cognitively developed they are, right? Their, their, their brains don't work, their minds don't work quite as, as maturely as the others. So the older kids can understand, they can understand why they fled a country and why the U.S. is doing what it's doing, um, they get it, but the youngers, uh, younger ones don't. So even for the separation of the older children, it's traumatic, but perhaps one could say it's less traumatic than. And what I want to do is talk to you about what happens to the little ones, the young ones who were separated in the summer of 2018. And so I want to look at uh, and show you the, the effects on uh, child attachment to the parent, to the caregiver. So here's what we know, and, and if there are any experts on attachment uh, uh, out there, forgive me if I mangled your, your field, but we know that attachment, I, I did have a chance to study this during my doctoral training. Um, attachment and bonding, we, we, we know all about it, right? We know it's the fundamental human connection between the infant, the child, and the parent. It's, it's important. Um, emotionally, uh, they, you know, they, they develop schemas of who their parents are, um, and they blossom through the good care of parents. Uh, it is important. We know even now that, it, that that attachment, that early attachment, follows us through, through life. So now there's research on adult attachment kind of styles and, and that sort of thing. And we do know that uh, secure attachment is the best. A child who is securely attached to their parents um, is, is the healthier child. Uh, a securely attached child, after a separation from the parent, upon, upon um, um, reunion, they run to their parents' arms in glee, and they swing around, and daddy this, daddy that, whatever, mommy, um, they, they run, and they, they interact with um, the parent very effectively after, after a separation. After all, parents have to go to work, a nanny stays, or a grandmother or someone takes care of the child or they're in daycare. But that fundamental bond with their parent is still, is still there, is well developed. And what the results are, we know through research, is that a, well, a securely attached child not, not only has better interpersonal relationships, but emotionally, they're more self-confident, Cognitively, there's better cognitive development, language development, all, this, all the outcomes that come with parents or children being given good parenting. We know, though, that when there's um, an impairment in that relationship, we have insecure attachment, and there are different forms that it takes. So um, let me just stop a moment before I move to that. So let's talk about the adverse events that happened to the, to, the, to, the, um, to the refugees and immigrants that we're talking about. Detention and separation we can consider as adverse childhood experiences. Uh, do most of you know what ACE, uh, adverse childhood experiences? I hit a seal nod, nodding head, so I won't go through it. Um, but essentially, right, so these, these, the more you have of these child, adverse childhood experiences, the worse it is for you because it's, you know, it's stress and trauma piled on top across the years. And what do we have in detention? Parents become tense. They're, of course, distressed. The number of mothers I saw who were anxious and depressed um, was, was incredible. The, as I mentioned earlier, the family structures and interactions are disrupted. So family rituals, for example, right? So what we, we don't think about them in everyday life, but families have rituals. Every night at dinner, we perhaps go through a ritual of who sets the table and what we talk about and who talks first and what daddy does, or even at Thanksgiving when Uncle Bernie is there and Uncle Bernie always gets drunk and starts telling body jokes, you know. That's, that's part of who we are as a family. Oh, we know Uncle Bernie's coming and we're gonna enjoy our, our time with him. Um, but it, it, it's who you are. When you're in detention, all of that is gone. You don't have extended families, you don't have rituals. You're governed by the, by the, the clock and the schedule of the of the prison, and mothers cannot discipline their children. 
They cannot feed their children their favorite foods because they don't have places to cook. They can't do the kind of the nightly rituals that we might with our kids, you know, the, the, uh, the cup of milk with the cookies. Okay, let's say our, night pray, our nighttime prayers and remember to include your grandparents, uh, you know, or mom tell me a story. They don't have that life because in the room there are four other families milling about, kids running around. So there's that disruption that goes on. And children also see their parents weakened, disempowered by the fact that they can't do what parents do. So kids are left with a sense of insecurity, right? My mom can't help me here. I'm, they just can't help me because I'm under these conditions. And, 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 we, and I heard a lot about that. Uh, there was one boy that I'll call Fernando, and, and Fernando is a, a boy who was also in the same uh, Carnes Detention Center, uh, at, at the same detention center as, as uh, Danny was. And um, he had fled, I forget the exact reasons, but of course the violence. And his mom was a leader among the mothers in the detention center who decided to go on a hunger strike. Uh, the prison squelched the hunger strike, and um, they targeted the leaders. His mom was one of them. So they held him in isolation for 24 hours, meaning a room with a camera. And I, I in interviewed the mom and, and the boy separately so I could get a sense of how, um, uh, how unified they were in the experience, right? So they described where all the cameras are. I had her draw the room and where all the cameras were in the room and how long the lights were on and where the bathroom was. And I asked the little boy, they drew identical, virtually identical pictures of everything. 24 hours in detention because she had been part of a hunger strike. We later argued with the prison people and they said, oh, no, we, we didn't keep her in isolation. Uh, the door was unlocked all along. She could have walked back to her room. Well, you know, when you're in a prison and they put you in a room, you don't think you have the liberty of trying that front door and walking out, which probably was locked anyways. But that's the sort of thing that, that, uh, that was happening to Fernando. And then I'm, I'm at the time, literally, when I'm uh, having Fernando draw for me uh, the pictures, um, his mother bursts into the room. We have these small cubicles, probably smaller than this platform, for, the, for, for lawyers and advocates to come in. And, she's, and she starts saying, they're listening to you. They hear you. And I'm saying, what? She says, I was outside, and they, they said something. I heard the walkie-talkie, something about, uh, it's the one who led the, uh, the, the hunger strike. And she assumed that, them, now remember, she's under a great deal of pressure, and the paranoia is starting to affect her. She runs in. She tells us, they're listening to you. And she gets on her hands and knees. And she's gra grasping under the table and under the chairs for devices, listening devices. She's looking at the corner of the room. Um, at, she's even looking at the light sockets and things like that to see where the cameras and the mics were. Now, I, I think the place was, was not bugged. But that's the level of, of stress that parents are under. So there's Fernando watching his mother spiral into this paranoid state. And all I saw in his eyes were terror. They were alone together. They, there was no other sibling, no father. So imagine this seven-year-old boy seeing his mother kind of fall apart. And what, as a child, who will take care of me? Kids want their parents to be able to take care of them. That's the level of disruption that we were talking about in some of these cases. So then add separation to that, the separation that adds to the, the damaged parent-child relationship. And again, we know that that um, attachment, secure attachment, has all kinds of beneficial effects on children. Learning, you know, lingu language development, social, emotional, you name it, as I mentioned before. And it shapes the brain, especially now that we've got great neuroscientists doing great things, looking at where, how the brain is affected, the growth, the development of the brain is affected by, by, tra by trauma and stress. We know that, that you know, uh, uh, there will be you know, uh, arrests in the development of the brain, the architecture, the wiring that would have happened normally under ordinary circumstances is now uh, thrown off, leading the child to be um, subject to mental health issues, to cognitive uh, problems, language problems, long-term health, uh, chronic health problems, all sorts of things. So we know the importance of, of you know, what, uh, wh how important it is to have give children secure, steady lives. And I think it's almost by studying kids like these that we see 
how damaging the results of detention and separation can be. So in the, in the summer of 2018, we not only had the detention now, at least the children were, were with their mothers. And uh, well, incidentally, I have to tell you the story because uh, a couple of stories. Um, one is that at Carnes, they banned, they banned uh, uh, crayons. That's right. Not bazookas, not guns. They banned crayons because the kids were paint coloring on the walls. And you know that meant that the private prison company was losing money because then they had to hire a firm to come out and clean the walls. And that's, they banned it. It was a big, it was a big deal uh, in Texas. And so they gave the kids back their crayons. And so we won uh, that one. Another time, I'm, um, I'm in San Angelo, Texas, and after a, a talk something like this, actually it was on something else, um, more fun than talking about this. Uh, and at the end of the day, we're sitting at our hotel uh, in the evening around the pool, smoking cigars, drinking scotch, and there's a few of us there from the group that I was with, and a gentleman walks in, and, or walks out to the patio and sits across from us. And Texans mean as they are really friendly people, how y'all doing today? So one of my colleague friends says hello to this gentleman, um, and, they, and, he says, and they say, so what, do you, what brings you here? And he says, well, I'm here, I'm the regional manager of, uh, for um, e, uh, GEO, GEO is a private prison com company, and we run the local county, county uh, prison here. And um, I kept my mouth shut, because I knew that GEO ran uh, Carnes. And one of my colleagues, though, said, oh, well, you know, this guy over here, he, uh, he's working, uh, you know, he, he does this kind of work. Uh, and so, no, no, no. And he says, yeah, this guy, and so the guy kept quiet, and I said, and I said, um, um, oh yeah, Carnes, you know, a lot of families there, he says, and all he said to me was, cash cow, cash cow. That was all he said. They were making money on children. So, so you, you know, so okay, I'll stop there, because when he realized I was on the opposite side, um, he decided he didn't want to smoke cigars with us. But it was, it was that sort of thing, you know, to see it as that, uh, as, as an opportunity to make money on the suffering of others. Um, and by the way, we have the prison industrial complex. Many of the people who are leaving Homeland Security are now working for uh, the Correction Corporation of America or GEO. And there's this kind of traffic, which we've seen, you know, lobbying. We do that, it happens a lot in the government. But now the people who were in Homeland Security are now oftentimes working for these private prison com companies. I got lots of stories I can tell you. Oh, and then when I committed a crime, a federal crime, um, I was going to Carnes and um, I had to interview a little girl. And I knew her, based on the records, I knew that it was her birthday that week, like maybe that Sunday or that Monday. So I went to my favorite, I was stopping at my favorite coffee place and bakery, and I, and I bought two um, muffins, really nice muffins, really nice. No brand, because that was too healthy. Um, for a you know, I, I brought two of them. So I happened to be bringing also along my hand puppets so I could talk to the kids and we could do the, the, the I took, <laughs> I took the muffins and put them in there with my hand puppets in the box that they came in. And I, I, I took a deep breath as they went through the, that, the x-ray machine. I thought they would catch me and say, get out of here. They went through. They went through. I brought them in. I interviewed the girl and her mom. I did the assessment. I said, on your way out. I said, can you? And they were like, they hadn't had a muffin, and it was also a birthday, a birthday in prison. So, you know, charge me, right? I'll do time for two muffins, you know. I guess that gets you, you know, I don't know, 15 years to life or something uh, in a federal prison. But you, you can't help but still remain human uh, in, uh, under these conditions. So, sorry, I, I, I can get off on that. So, so now we know that when there's this disruption in the attachment, through separations, we get certain types of insecure. Remember, there's the secure group and the insecure group. So one of the styles of attachment is called insecure avoidant, right? Where the child expects rejection from the parent upon the reunion. So because you have left me, I'm not so sure about you. That's what the child's reaction is. And so they avoid, avoid the parent rather than seek proximity, which I said in the, in the, in the security attached child, the child runs. I mean, I, I see it all the time with my, my my granddaughter, she runs to her mommy and daddy after we've been caring for, for her on a weekend or something. Um, and um, I'm sorry, this is a, a voice to reduce. Yeah, so the, 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 the avoidance is in order to reduce 
the possible conflict or rejection that they felt. So the repetition of the rejection from their parents. So they don't seek proximity. They really avoid the parent. Another insecure attachment style is the insecure ambivalent style, in which the child is uncertain about the parent's response upon the reunion. I'm not, I'm not sure about you. I'm going to come to you, but I still don't trust you. And they may be passive or angry, resistant behavior um, that establishes some proximity, but also it's like, you know, um, you've seen the kids in, in the parent's arm, but they're like leaning back, um, but they're close to their parents. Uh, and so when the parent responds to the child on the reunion, the child is ambivalent, ambivalent and isn't comforted by the parent. So I want us to spend a couple of minutes viewing videos of these two forms of insecure attachment of children who were separated in the detention centers from, the, from their parents and then reunited. Well, I'm sorry, there's a third, uh, third child, it is organized, and it's, it's a much uh, more difficult sort of the child attachment, disorganized attachment, which a child really doesn't know what to do. There's almost a sense of a fugue-like state, uh, but I haven't seen those, so I can't, I can't show you any of those. So this is, let's, this is a case of an insecure avoidant attachment. So this is little Sammy uh, being reunited with his family in July of 2018. It was captured by CBS or NBC or one of those. Actually, this is a film from the ACLU. And she, she, they are reuniting. The story behind Sammy is that it was an intact family, father, mother, Sammy, and a little sister, a baby sister, who you'll see in the, in the video. And that when they came, they separated them. They took Sammy with his father and put him in one detention center, and mom and the baby in another detention center. And they spent three months apart. But the dad and Sammy were yet separated more. So he was, he was taken away from his father. So Sammy was left behind, uh, left separated. The baby stayed with the mom. After about three months, the father and the son were reunited, and then they come to uh, uh, Houston's uh, airport to do the reunion. Now, watch Sammy here carefully, and maybe I'll, I'll play it back and forth. Um, he expects rejection, so he's avoiding his, his mom. Um, oh, wait, wait, time out. How do you stop this? Uh, you don't hear that, right? Is there sound above on this? Were you able to hear it? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm hearing it. Okay, so let me, let me go back a second here. So they're reuniting. Now watch, look at him, just that, even in that still shot. He's looking away. She's trying to grab him, and he's not. This is their first moment of reuniting after three months. Look at him. Okay. Let me stop it there, sorry. He's going away from his mom. And for a moment there, you think he's gonna seek the comfort of his father. But he walks right between his father's legs. So he's not being comforted by that either, though he's had more time with his father. So I, I know they're to play it, I'm sorry. Um, that's what separation, sudden rupture of a child and parents, you know, connection can do, and the separation for three months. And it's inexplicable, right? So let's assume for a moment that the mom had to go into the hospital, and she was there for three months, and he was in the care of the grandmother. There's love, there's affection, there's family, so there's, there's at least some, some surrogate attachment and maybe it would be difficult to reattach with mom, although chances are they would probably have brought the baby to the, air, uh, to, the, uh, to the hospital and that sort of thing. But not here. This is sudden, inexplicable, you know, rupturing of a, an important tie. 
you, you may have seen this family on 60 Minutes once because they did a follow-up on them. And the, the, they were now living in the U.S. or at least waiting for their asylum uh, claims to be, to be settled. Uh, and the mom said, well, he's doing better now, but he's still not the same child I had. He still doesn't quite understand. And for, okay, let me stop there for a minute. So this is what we hear. Now, what would you as clinicians want to do with this family if they came to your school or your clinic? That's, anybody? I won't, we won't go on too long, but just, any ideas? Yes, ma'am. Oh, you were just scratching your head. Okay, anybody else? Well, come on, clinicians. What would you do? What's that? Lots of time together. And what would you do in that time together with, there'd be supervision. You'd be saying, okay, mom, because you know, she may be, as in that film, as in that film, she might be chasing him. Maybe you tell her, don't. Let's wait right here. We want him to know you're still here. And he can roam around the room and you're not leaving. And begin to reconnect him to his mother in a meaningful way that he can begin to trust. Maybe she can go out and get a glass of water and come back. And let's see how distressed he is. But you are now reconnecting and reattaching that child so that he understands that his mom is not abandoning him again. You know. Yes? Absolutely. But would Sammy understand that? Not quite. The mom. But I mean through the actions of mm. the Yes. Right. And, you know, with the parents, there's going to be the psychoeducational piece. You know, Sammy is doing this not because he doesn't love you. He's been traumatized. And the mother gets it. Mi hijo está traumado. She's got, she knows that something's happened to him, that he's a different child. And she's pursuing him. And notice the father. He's clutching onto the baby girl he hasn't seen in three months. You know, I mean, this is just in a brief moment, we could see part of the damage. But we have to think about these are the families that we're going to see in our clinics. So here's a case of insecure, ambivalent uh, attachment. And this boy was now, uh, he's older than Sammy. Um, he's much more verbal, so I don't know, five, six years old now. And he was now, he had been released from detention. I'm sorry, well, he had, he had been separated from his mom in detention. Then they were brought together. They were released, and now they're at some kind of shelter for mothers and kids uh, run by um, uh, a, a religious group, a Catholic group. Now, if you, if you hear what this boy is saying, um, Henry is his name, um, he's really uncertain about his mother's affection. He's not sure about her. He's angry, and he's resistant. Oops, hold on. I, I think I can do this. I may have to do it this way because this is. Can you hear that? Okay, sorry. You... Oh, this is not a touch screen. I'm sorry. I'm touching the screen. There's nothing's happening. Um, I want to go back to jail. A five-year-old, whatever he is, you can see there. Um, I want to go back to jail. Um, oops. Oh, oh. oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, please. Thank you very much. Um, so this is this is a case, and you'll see in a moment what he's saying to his mom, um, because evidently. So, you're, in the full video, uh, in the full video, uh, he's playing with his mom outside. They're doing something. But there are those moments when there's a conflict or some expectation uh, or some conflict or sense that his mom didn't do something for him. And now, um, okay, so, so that's okay. So. Okay, so let's start with from the beginning. I think you're good. You don't love me. Um, 
I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to get this. Okay. fue muy larga mi hijo ya ha cambiado mucho con tanto trauma ya no quiero ser tu hijo ya no soy tu hijo me dijo that's the that's the kind of painful um, experiences that um, uh, these families experience and this is a boy too, where we will have to do a great deal of work. He's more cognitively advanced than Sammy was, so the work will be different. The, the, the work that we're gonna do with him and his mom, he may be able to understand a little bit more that it wasn't your mommy who, who abandoned you, it was because, and he may be able to understand it a little bit more than, than, uh, than little uh, Sammy. Now, in DSM, Th uh, three, I'm still dating myself. DSM-5, thank you very much. Um, I remember when it was DSM-2 and it was this thin. It was like this. And um, when I didn't know what, how to diagnose a patient that was before me back in New York, there was one place I could always give, and that was the, a personality disorder. It was called inadequate personality disorder. I thought, that's, that's about right. <laughs> you know, so, um, it's not funny, but, but anyways. In those days, we had much, uh, much less criteria. But reactive attachment disorder, you will see now, it's an inhibited, emotionally withdrawn behavior toward the parent. It is about attachment. Um, and there's limited positive affect that the child demonstrates. There will be these unexplained moments of irritability, sadness, or fear fearfulness. And in many ways, the second boy, Henry, you see more of that because, again, he's more verbal. Um, and mo most often, these children will have experienced some neglect deprivation, the sudden or repeat uh, changes in caregivers, uh, and the time spent in unusual places like detention centers. So we, we need to think about that. Um, we know that these kids, whether they went through detention and weren't separated or were in detention and were separated, their developmental trajectories are not going to look like the average child. They will have experienced something that's very different. There, there will be this dysregulation of all sorts of stress response systems, symptoms, uh, uh, systems, there's stress response systems, symptoms and behaviors, dissociative uh, episodes, which, which I, have, I have seen, uh, upsetting memories and nightmares, kind of the, that intrusive, the burden of, of, that we talked earlier about uh, that, that comes with the trauma, fear of being returned to their home is, a, is their home country, they will feel poorly about themselves because we were in prison. Why were we in prison? We must have done something wrong. And there's this all loss of hope and poor self-esteem regulation. Um, we will see in them uh, uh, psychological, social, academic impairments. And what's so essential too is a sense of not belonging. You don't belong in this country, but you don't feel like you belong in the country of origin because they're, they're trying to kill you there. And you know, that's a statelessness uh, kind of, where you don't feel you belong. And I think we need to have people feel that they belong in, in, in a place. Children need that sense of rooting. We all do. We need to, to stay in a place and feel like we're a part of it. Uh, members of churches, you know, playground groups, uh, uh, schools, even the people we see at the Walmart or at the supermarket, where you sense that there's a continuity and a sense that you are part of a community. And that's so important. We're, we've been doing some work uh, in, in looking at the U.S. citizen children of parents who have been deported. We, we studied a group in Mexico by called the Exiles and the ones in the U.S. left behind with their parents. After their parents were deported, we called them the orphans. And one of the, the themes that runs through their interviews is the sense of not belonging. I don't belong here, I don't feel like I belong here, although I'm a US citizen because my parents don't, are, are being, you know, have been sent away, 
um, and I don't belong there because I, may not, I don't speak Spanish, perhaps, or speak Spanish quite the way they do in Mexico. I don't have the behavioral you know, repertory of a person who's grown up in Mexico. I'm an American. I know American football, not Mexican football. You know? so it's, it's, or even the, the, the history and the geography of Mexico. We, that's the group we're studying, by the way, in Mexico. So there's a sense of, of you know, where, where do I belong? And that's critical for, for, for mental health. And so I'm going to end on this, um, which is what we need. And what you as, as faculty members, students entering the field, the, the helping professions, whichever one of those professions is, um, members of our community, practitioners here, and advocates and leaders, we, we, these folks in detention and after detention need medical care, urgent medical care. We've seen back in, uh, was it um, Clint, Texas, where they found like 300 kids, unaccompanied minors, who hadn't, uh, been taken care of, there was a huge uh, flu outbreak, and it was not, it was only when a bunch of journalists and advocates discovered that kids were being kept in these, in these conditions, and the baby's diapers hadn't been changed for days, it, it was awful, and so there was that need immediate. We need to do the psychosocial assessments and begin the therapeutic interactions like the ones we were just talking about and the individual work with parents, right? And, and, and I haven't touched on the trauma of the adults, whether it's the men or the women that, that will need the, the services to help them through. Because when we talk about intergenerational trauma, this is a subpopulation that we will have to, uh, 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 that we will see and have to deal with with respect to that. The psychoeducational services for parents, as I mentioned, having Sammy's mother and Henry's mother understand why their children uh, responded that way so that they can understand the developmental impact, the clinical impact. Doing some child, uh, parent-child interaction therapy. The educational assessments that they're going to need so that we can fit them into the schools that they're going to in our communities and then bring them into our community so that they have a sense of belonging, that they are welcomed and, and supported even if, even if after a few years they are deported to their homes because their asylum claims were, were turned down. Um, and I think we've, you know, it's our duty as a country uh, and as, as, as humans, as people, to, to take care of those who have less and who have suffered more. And with that, I'll end, and thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. So I want to thank Dr. Sayas for that wonderful presentation. I know it gave us a lot of context on the reality that many families and Hispanics and Latinos are facing right now. Uh, we have a few minutes before the schedule break, so if you would like or you have some questions, you would like to uh, use the opportunity to reach out to Sayas. So. Excellent. That means everybody got it. Oh, that one. I'm glad you caught that. I'm glad you caught that because I was, I was speaking uh, kind of generally and quickly rather than specifically. In most instances, the, the, the PTSD child uh, trauma scales don't do the trick um, because they're, they're intended more for a U.S. audience or, you know, I guess it's not an audience, but a, a clinical population. And we talk about the traumas that we know in this country, right? Um, car crashes, you know, maybe some domestic violence. But they don't capture the sort of enveloping, ambient danger and violence that occurs. We're probably, it's probably more likely to be seen in, um, in inner city settings in the United States, that level. But this is still different because even in inner city settings, we have police who are trying to do their job. In their countries, the police are complicit, are corrupt, and are ineffective. So there's violence all around. You may not have seen the violence, but as you're walking along and there's a body hanging from an overpass or a, or a decapitated head uh, on the street, those instruments don't capture that level of everyday trauma that many of these kids do. 
With that said, there are a couple of places that you might turn to. There's the, um, uh, or, or instruments. One is the uh, UCLA risk, uh, trauma risk assessment. It requires clinical assessment. I mean, it really is, is, is helpful. It takes too long for some of the assessments I'm doing. The other is Harvard has its Refugee Mental Health Center, and they, they have, over the years, developed uh, uh, instruments that will, that will measure that level of trauma. Most of it has come out of the work from you know, refugees from Africa um, who have suffered uh, you know, kind of genocide and that sort of thing. So I'm glad you caught that, but um, I didn't mean to say there weren't any. It's just that most of the ones that we would have in our, in our offices most likely would not cover that. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, you can ask short questions. I'll just give you long answers. No? Okay, well, thank you all very much. Oh, well, there's a hand back there. Okay, sorry, the lights are, yes, sir. Uh, effects where in in their home country uh, in the countries that oh yes um, it where do I begin it really is 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 terribly disruptive in our study we had uh, a teenage girl who attempted suicide as one fortunately she didn't she didn't uh, uh, die by her hand because her father had been deported and he was such an important part of the family uh, we have had uh, situations where the, the, where an entire family has gone back to Mexico. Well, not back, because remember, the kids are U.S. citizens. They've never been to Mexico. They are now living in Mexico. And there's, there's a lot of disruption in their life, academically, especially, but socially as well. They are U.S., you know, they're Americans. They're seen as gringos, and the kids will tease them because they don't speak Spanish quite the way, or they dress, you know, in ways that are different here. Uh, there than, you know, than here. And so there is that. And so not only is this, this, this displacement of the child in that setting, but then the, 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 the friction with parents, I want to get out of here. I want to get out of here as soon as I can. And the teenagers have a chance because they can, they're like, say, 15, right? And they, can, they know that in a few more years, I'm a U.S. citizen. I can go back and go to college uh, and, and, and continue my life there. The younger ones don't have that. Um, so they're, they're caught in a different uh, sort of situation. Um, they're at, at the, the older kids don't resent their parents. In fact, they're grateful for what their parents have done, put their own lives at risk to raise their children here and give them a good future. Um, so there's not that sort of you know, dynamic uh, of, of anger, but it is disruptive to families, as you, as you can imagine. I, I hope that answers your, your question. Yes, ma'am. Um, there might be folks studying that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, frankly, I don't know. And one of the reasons I don't know is because when, when we see the families, we've either seen them at the detention center or at the bus depot where they're heading out to all parts of the country. Their way, they, what happens is that they have a family in the U.S. who has paid their, their airfare or, or train bus fare to wherever they're heading. So they go to California, Oregon, Michigan, New York, Florida, North Carolina, all sorts of places. So we don't have, we don't really know. Uh, and I don't know if there's any formal organization that is using particular approaches. Um, so I'm sorry I can't answer that. But, but there are many agencies all around um, doing good work and just, you know. So um, maybe uh, Dr. Torres later, I can, he can tell you about what's going on in his field. Others? Yes, ma'am. Zero. So zero. Here's um, when they when we meet them at the well. By the time they, they get to the, the San Antonio bus station, uh, they have been reunited. If there if there was a separation, although they taught, they've cut back the, the number of separations, uh, they arrive with no money. The the family that um, paid for their bus fare. Uh, that's all they have, and they get a, a number. They go to the, the 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 ticket agent, and he looks it up and gives them the tickets to wherever they're going. But they leave with nothing. They are given nothing, uh, money or uh, whatnot. One one time, my wife and I were 
were flying out of uh, Austin to go to uh, JFK, and we happened to be sitting near these next, uh, that is uh, at, the, at the boarding gate area, um, with these few women who obviously were Central American, obvious to me because I kind of worked enough, and they were speaking Spanish, but they were very controlled, and uh, one of them would leave at a time, and they would take their, their flights to different locations, and there was this last young lady who happened to be on the flight that we, my wife and I were on. And um, the, one of the, uh, the guys who worked there said to my wife, do you speak Spanish? And my husband and I, you know, we can, he said, could you explain, you know, that you're, she's taking this flight and what she did? So we began to talk to her. She had, she had been, that was about three in the afternoon. Our flight was like at five o'clock at night. Uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. She had been brought there by ICE at 3 a.m. the day before the morning of that flight, um, and with no money and no food, only the papers that said she had an asylum case. And, um, and it was interesting because I asked her, ¿Tiene hambre? Do you? And she said, oh, no, no, I'm okay. But when a woman, my wife, spoke to her, she said, oh, yes. I mean, so there was, you can imagine, that her name was Margarita, um, you can imagine what it must have been like, you know, for her, that it was hard to, tell a man who's willing, I mean, I'm there with my wife, I'm willing to buy her food, um, but she wouldn't tell me, but she told my wife. So my wife went and bought stuff, put it in a bag, and uh, on board, I told the, the, the flight attendant, whatever she wants, I'll pay for it. And then when we got to JFK, it was the first time she had seen an escalator, so we you know, showed her how an escalator works, uh, and called her family to get her there. And it was while I was getting our luggage that I turned around and she was eating. And that was because now, you know, she and my wife had enough trust that she could eat the, the food that my wife had hoarded from the, uh, you know, had bought at the, at the, at the uh, airport. It's, those are the, the moments that are so touch, you know, so, so, uh, so uh, tragic and agonizing for us to, to, to see that she'd been sitting there 12 hours without any food after being released. And by the time she did eat, it was at least, you know, another, you know, few more hours. So um, they, they'd given them nothing, basically. Even, our, even prisoners who are, who are um, released from prison will get you know, a, a, a suit of clothes and, I don't know, $18 or whatever it is. Um, but these folks are given nothing, are given nothing. Incidentally, in detention, they don't know how long they're going to be in detention. So it's worse than prison. Because in a prison, you have a sentence and you're going to, you can notch off the days on your calendar. In detention, it's suspended. You don't know when, and it could happen tomorrow and suddenly, or it might not happen at all. So that adds to that whole deprivation and threat uh, issue. One more time? One more uh, or, or, or so. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. I don't know any, any, anything about that one organization. There are, there are numerous, mostly um, religious-based organizations that are taking many of the, of the, um, the unaccompanied minor. We had a, a terrible situation in, in, in Texas where one of the nonprofits, you may have read about it and heard about it, where they were making lots of money on, on the unaccompanied minors. And the, the CEOs uh, of the organization went from a few hundred thousand dollars salary to 1.4 million in a matter of time. So even the nonprofits, he's persona non grata, as you can imagine now. But I don't know about, the, the, I don't know about that. But there are many organizations that are, that are handling them. Um, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. And it, I, you're speaking specifically about an organization in Colorado? Oh. Yes. Okay. That, that may very well be. I, I don't know about that. But indeed, you're right. They do have these, or, uh, these places where uh, kids, unaccompanied minors, are kept. And basically, they're different levels of secure. We, I was part of a New York Civil Liberties Union case uh, against uh, the Office of Refugee Resettlement by, with the way they were handling the kids, and even the contract agencies that, that were holding the kids were becoming more prisons than therapeutic 
facilities. One more question, I think. And I did see it. Was there? Okay, then I hallucinated that last hand. Okay, well, thank you all very much, and uh, best wishes to you.